bet. Well, Governor, thank you. I'll make sure everyone can hear me. My mic is working. Um, thank you so much for being here. And uh, I just do want to also give uh, a lot of thanks to all the lawmakers that we have in the room. Uh, Speaker Moore, thank you. Lieutenant Governor Farris, thank you. Uh, earlier we had the state treasurer in here. Uh, also acknowledge uh, Phil Handy is here from Florida. He's on the foundation board. Thank you for making the trip up. Um, it is always a good occasion when you can impress your in-laws, and my in-laws are here. <laughs> Thank you, my family. Um, uh, my grandmother, Diane Kramer, is here. Uh, between her and her husband, uh, they had a high school diploma between the two of them, but with great determination, they pulled themselves up by their bootstraps and, and now uh, are, are sitting here. Uh, and of course, my wife, Rachel Johnson, who uh, for some reason agreed to letting me run for this office. Uh, but. If anyone in this room knows uh, who's elected, it, it definitely uh, it, it takes the whole family. And so thank you, Rachel, for your support. Governor, um, your reputation for you. you can hear from the introductions. Uh, many things come to mind uh, when we talk about you and uh, what Florida's done for education and what you have been doing for nearly 20 years. Uh, but what recently occurred is, is something that is uh, even more astounding. And that's when the NAEP scores recently came out. And for those of you in the room who might not know NAEP, it's the nation's report card uh, that every state uh, in, in the nation takes. Uh, the results were flat for, for students. There was uh, not much improvement shown. Uh, in some places, results actually went down, uh, except for Florida. Except for Florida. And in Florida, uh, results have gone up. And I think I just want to open this up with uh, some words of wisdom from you on uh, what would you say to a state like North Carolina that wants to, to emulate and replicate that success? Well, first of all, when the NAEP, NAEP scores come out, you know that they're being released. That they, they say that you know on Tuesday morning they'll be released. I was always praying the rosary on Monday night, just for the record, <laughs> because uh, the reforms that are being implemented uh, here uh, are similar to the ones in Florida. And they can't be sustained unless you have rising student achievement. If you, you know, if you're trying to turn the world upside down and transform the system, and you get fewer students gaining the power of knowledge, fewer grade level readers, fewer uh, people that are college and or career ready, then you know it's not it's really hard to sustain those those uh, efforts. So in Florida, we were 29th out of 31 on the. For the, for the, the NAEP test for fourth grade reading in 1998. That was the year that I ran for office. And after uh, eight years, in 2006, we were sixth out of 50 on the fourth grade reading test. Florida's Hispanic students today do two grade levels ahead of the California Hispanic students, uh, even though the per student funding in Florida is probably significantly less than it is in California. Florida's low-income students are, in the, in the reading and math, uh, are the best in the country. So the lesson learned here is you've got to stick with it, and you've got to have big and bold reforms and implement them faithfully, and incredible things can happen. And uh, what we did in Florida is very similar to what the path that you're on. We graded schools A, B, C, D, and F. 100% based on student learning. A really radical idea that you would measure school effectiveness based on um, something, an outcome that you believe to be important. Um, we added incentives for higher level coursework like AP classes and IB classes and then nationally recognized certificates. And we got a lot more of those and schools did better. We ended social promotion in third grade and put reading coaches in every low income school and then every middle school as well elementary school and, and middle school to teach teachers how to teach reading because surprisingly you don't learn how to teach reading when you're a, a, a student at the schools of education in most places in the country. I hope that that's not the case here but I'd be surprised if all of a sudden students, elementary school teachers come into the classroom immediately knowing how to teach reading. So we, we brought coaches in to train teachers on how to teach reading. We, we had a third of our children that were uh, below basic readers. That's the polite bureaucratic term for functionally illiterate. Uh, and we eliminated, we, we created a policy that said if you were functionally illiterate, you would not be able to go to fourth grade. And so the first year that that took place, Mark, was my re-election year. And um, if nothing changed, a third of the third graders would have stayed in, in third grade. It would have been, uh, a lot of moms would have been mad at their governor because I was responsible for this idea. 
But we cut that in more than half in one year. And the reason why we've had these ex extraordinary learning gains is the kids at the bottom, the kids that are always kind of left behind, discarded, are the, are the ones that have had the greatest gains in Florida because the accountability system is designed to make sure that every student counts. That you can't gain the system. Every kid has to get some degree of uh, learning gains or, or you're, you're penalized. We rewarded schools with $100 per student for the eight, the schools that were graded A or showed improvement. And um, the teachers union, the first year we did this, came to the state board of education meeting and they said, we're giving back our bonus money. I said, fine, we'll just reallocate it to the other schools. I appreciate you being so generous. And that was the last time that that ever happened. And this, the celebration, it's the largest um, reward for teachers in the United States. $150 million goes directly to schools, 90% of which goes to bonuses for teachers for showing improvement or being A-rated. The net effect of this is we have rising student achievement, which has sustained the reforms. And now North Carolina and Florida are on the vanguard of many of these reforms. And I, I expect if you stay the course, you'll get the kind of learning gains that you would want, want to have. Uh, the final thing I'd say is if North Carolina joined us on that journey a long time ago, where we were 50th in the graduation rate in 1998, uh, and you, you had the same kind of gains that we've had on the NAEP test for eighth grade and fourth grade reading and math, you'd be number one in the country. You'd be ahead of Massachusetts in uh, fourth grade meet, reading and fourth grade math. That should be what we call in Florida a BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal. That should be the aspiration of North Carolinians that believe in the state and believe that great things can happen. You should be number one. And with the reforms in place, with a concerted effort to make them happen, and maybe converting a governor along the way to, to be a partner in this, uh, certainly you've got a great superintendent that's an extraordinary partner, and getting the business community involved and getting political and business leadership and civic leadership involved, you could, you could achieve it. Thank you. I, I do have bad news. Uh, the bad news is that uh, Margaret Spellings, who's a great leader of our university system, has done an audit of our ed prep programs and did find that in North Carolina, we are not properly teaching teachers how to teach reading. Well, she's now responsible for that, so she better get on her own. <laughs> tell her I told her, tell her I said that. Well, no, actually, don't tell her that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you know Margaret, that may not. She's pretty tough. So, uh, as a way of uh, opening up the fact that the General Assembly here uh, has actually invested hundreds of millions of dollars into Read to Achieve, uh, which was inspired by the work you did in Florida to focus on K-3 literacy. Uh, when I got to the Department of Education, uh, unbelievably we found that millions of dollars in the Read to Achieve program meant for classrooms was not making it to classrooms. Uh, we just, we couldn't believe it and we knew we had to do something about it. And one thing that we just launched, and it's launching this year, is called Wolfpack Works. So it's with NC State, and in the lowest performing districts, every new kindergarten, first grade, or second year teacher is going to have one-on-one -on -one reading coaching, uh, thanks to the investment from the General Assembly. And it's a pilot program this year. We're really excited to, to see uh, what the results will be. Uh, but at the end of the day, none of this uh, matters if we don't have transparent data on how to show, uh, show us how students are doing it. Uh, for example, this pilot program, Wolfpack Works, will need the data to show that it's working. Um, how, how do we use these tools to best uh, show everyone uh, how, how we can be accountable and how we are, are showing success, but also owning where we're not being successful? So, look, data matters uh, because you can adjust your policies to, to make sure that they're relevant to what you're trying to achieve. We didn't always get it right the first time, but we, we, uh, the le our legislature was uh, extraordinarily uh, visionary. Phil Handy, who was the chairman of the State Board of Education, uh, was a big uh, proponent of this and was successful in, in getting the money over a long-term basis to, to follow the child, to measure how children were doing pre-K to life, in effect. In Florida, you can tie student learning to where they go to college, you can tie student learning to the teachers, how they, you know, how successful they are with like-kind students. You can look at the schools of education in our state and see which uh, beginning teachers have the best learning gains for low-income kids or for kids on average or whatever it is. 
we have all these tools and they're, they're very effective to be able, just as a business uses data to be able to drive its strategies through, through the enterprise, uh, we were successful in using that data across the board. And what we found, and, and I, I would start with one of the tools that we had uh, that still exists is, a, is the first week of kindergarten in every kindergarten class in Florida, you have a, an assessment of where, where students start. Now, if you, can, if you can customize the learning experience and you have trained teachers that know how to teach reading, you can catch up pretty quick. Uh, but you can also measure if they're at home learning to read when they're three and four years old, or if they're in a, you know, a, a public setting or a private setting. Having that data actually can help drive policy in a very effective way. So I would, it's, it's always hard for members of the legislature to, you know, you have a downturn in the economy, which happens occasionally, and the first thing that gets cut is the data because it's not related to classroom education. So it was always a challenge, but the legislature in Florida was was uh, pretty steadfast in maintaining that commitment, and even to this day, while they're not as transparent as I'd like to see them in terms of opening up their resource to be able to provide uh, researchers the ability to, look, we can track since 1999, think, how, think of the treasure trove of information you have for the fourth largest or third largest student population in the country. 57%, uh, it's a minority majority state, we have more Hispanics and African Americans than we do Anglo, what we call Anglos, and we're 56 or 57 percent free and reduced lunch qualified. That is what America is going to look like, and having this data to be able to measure success and failure, uh, to be able to adapt policy seems to make sense to me. So I would, uh, I'm a data nerd, and I think you guys should be as well. Good. Um, well, as we've talked about, uh, I started my career as a teacher, uh, and uh, it would not be fair to have this conversation without talking about it here in North Carolina and, uh, and you've seen some other states in the news there's been teacher discontent uh, and how do you con convey uh, reform efforts to teachers uh, when there are certain groups that claim to represent all of them uh, that are as you discussed uh, in opposition to any change to the status quo well first of all teachers unions represent government you know, public employees, they represent half of the people they represent in most states are teachers. Under the guise of a pretty good brand, I mean, everybody loves their, their teacher when they were growing up. Most parents love the teacher that is in front of their, in front of their child each and every day. Uh, under the guise of saying we're a teacher's union, they're representing all public uh, employees in every school district in the country. So. Start with the premise that this isn't about teaching. This is about the political power of a union that uses their, their dues to be able to um, carry out a political agenda that goes way beyond teaching, way beyond teaching. It gets into the areas of foreign policy at the national level, uh, funding of Planned Parenthood. They're on the border right now dealing with these issues. Look, I, I don't, I'm not here to talk, have a view on those subjects, but that should not be the mission of a teacher's union. Teachers Union ought to be protecting the professionalization of teaching, and they do the exact opposite. So mark me down as uh, not neutral on the subject of teachers <laughs> unions. Every reform we put in place, they opposed. I went to them and said, instead of a classroom mandate that we had by constitutional edict, uh, we will be we would be in the top five in the country for beginning pay for teachers. We were not at the top five at the time this conversation took place. So every dollar that we would use to not have this arbitrary uh, reduction in class size uh, across the board, we would put it in teacher pay and in the professionalization of, of teaching, and they rejected it out of hand. Uh, they reject the idea of differentiated pay based on shortages. There's huge shortages of math teachers and science teachers and computer science teachers in this country, and I'm assuming that here in North Carolina that's the case. They should be paid more to be subject matter experts in those subjects. Or if they're in underserved areas, you probably have shortages in the rural areas or in some of the, the, the big urban areas where you can't find teachers uh, to be able to teach. They should be paid more to go into those areas. Uh, and if they're, if they're providing with like-kind students learning games that are lights out, they should be paid more. And every step along the way, the union tries, finds ways to try to stop this. Um, it's, it's very frustrating because the, it should be a profession. And if it's a profession, then you should have a scale of wages that is 
broader, and it shouldn't be just longevity of service that drives this. Uh, there are a lot of great teachers that leave the teaching profession because they're not treated as professionals. And I, I have to say that when I go speak with educators across the state, um, and I uh, speak at education conventions, uh, when we start talking about um, you know, really the transformation of education, we're moving out of the 20th century into the 21st century, um, that, that seems to be much less of a political uh, point with teachers. Um, I didn't know if you wanted to just briefly comment on you know, what personalized learning or career pathways uh, could do for the traditional system that we have now, moving it into uh, the 21st century, giving teachers 21st century tools instead of 20th century methods. Yeah, so uh, when, you were, when you were teaching, you, were, you showed up the first day, and my guess is that you quickly over the first few weeks realized who were the high achieving kids, who were the kids who were really struggling, and who were kids in the middle. If you had 25 kids in that classroom, a teacher is confronted with a real challenge. Who do I teach to? In this homogenized system uh, that has been around for 100 years, you basically teach to the median. You teach to the, to the middle. And uh, the net effect is that the, the kids that are struggling are pushed along without learning, and the kids that could learn more at a more rapid rate are held back. The, the net effect is that that teaching to the middle, that industrial model, uh, isn't really relevant in the world we're in now where you have big differences in, in terms of uh, where students start and how quickly they can learn. And you have, you have tools now that can quickly determine when someone has mastered the material so that they move on to the next. Imagine, um, the best, best description of this was uh, at one of our summits, uh, was Saul Khan, who runs Khan Academy. Most parents know Saul Khan because they figure out how to help their, you know, the first thing a parent does when they're trying to do algebra is to go learn algebra on Khan Academy. At least <laughs> mark me down as, as one of those participants. And the net effect is, he, he puts it this way, if, you're, if you get a 70 in a, you know, during your semester of math, you pass. Check the box, you're on to the next uh, you know, 180 days, you get that credit or two credits that year. But that means that you didn't know 30% of the material. And if you didn't know 30% 30, 30 of the material, the likelihood of knowing the next level of understanding, since math is a building block uh, of, of learning, is going to be harder and harder. Better to know 100% of the material and move on. Time should be the variable, and learning should be the constant. That radical idea would transform education. So how would you organize a school that was based on the variability being time and the learning being constant? It would require customized learning, personalized learning, harnessing technology. Uh, kids would grow, you know, they would, their age, they'd stay in the same classroom with their age cohort, but they could graduate from high school with a, you know, finished 30 hours of, of, of freshman credit in, in high school. They might, be able to also get a nationally recognized certificate that means that they're they're uh, not only college ready uh, but they're career ready and the kids that were fifth grade readers that were just pushed aside just kind of breathing for 180 days to get the funding uh, they would master this material and they may not be accelerating their learning but they would graduate from high school high school college or career ready and right now a third of our kids are college or career ready and that's the tragedy of America education system today. There's no one marching in the streets for the children that are eighth grade level readers graduating from high school with a piece of paper who's been their parent or parents or guardian think that they've got something of value. They don't. And the net effect on our society is, is going to be enormous as in the world that we're moving toward. That should be the great civil rights issue of our times. That should be the great moral issue of our times. And yet it's not. <laughs> And it's very frustrating, I know, for political leaders that are doing this, not because it's politically popular, but it's the right thing to do. And we need to garner a, a, you know, a popular political movement around a year's worth of knowledge in a year's time for every kid in every state. Thank you, and, I, and, and that, is, that is an argument that caught, cuts across the urban rural divide, cuts across yeah. politics, cuts mm -hmm. across uh, you know, reform versus status quo. And I can tell you, uh, I, I, it is a privilege and honor to be in my position, 
and I get to travel the state and visit classrooms, and I, I, I use those talking points about where we can transform education, where it can go, and I, I tell you, teachers, teachers are with us on the personalized learning. They're excited about it as well. Uh, let me ask you uh, just one more question, um, because we're, we're talking about uh, different choices and, and forms, uh, and, and you, you've, you've, uh, you've really been the forefront of the debate on choice. And in here in North Carolina, we have more charter schools, magnet schools, uh, we have programs that help uh, students from poverty uh, go to private schools, we have programs that uh, now help uh, special needs students. Um, you know, these programs are contentious. Can you tell us, being able to look back at when we started before we did, how Floridians are accepting these, these choices? Well, we now have constituencies for each one of our programs. So there's, I think, 110,000 corporate tax scholarship beneficiaries. These are low-income families that get, uh, I don't know the exact number, it's like 4,500 bucks, maybe it's 5,000 now. They get that, they get the, the dollars, um, and it saves the state money because the per student funding at a public school is probably $8,000. So point number one is make the argument, the compelling argument, that when you give parents options in the private side, it's going to save money, because it does. Don't, don't, let, don't let the argument be the exact opposite, which is the argument, the really sterile argument on the other side, which is you're taking money from public schools. No, you're giving money to parents to choose which school they go to, and if they choose a private school, the per student funding allocation is actually less than if it goes to a public school. That's the fact. And we lose that argument if we don't make it. You know, you, you don't win unless you advocate. So, so that's the first step is to um, is to empower uh, parents with these choices. And the net effect is you create a constituency, a hundred thousand families. There's a guy running for governor in Florida who says, "I'm going to get rid of the charter schools and the, get rid of the voucher programs." Oh, really? Let's see how that works with 225, <laughs> 230,000 kids going to charter schools in the state and. Another 150,000 kids that are going to uh, uh, private schools because of the, the, the government's interest in giving their parents choices. That's, that's a ton of people. You're going to get rid of the uh, magnet schools as well because, God forbid, if, if a parent could choose a school that's outside of what the monopoly dictates a kid to go to, you're going to get rid of the universal pre-K program where 150,000 four-year-olds go to uh, options decided, designed by their families for a half a day learning program? No, the question is, the, the, so the second step is, you build a constituency and they can't take it away. It's, if, you're, if you're talking about families losing something that they believe is their right, uh, that has been enormously successful, then it's really hard for the apparatchik uh, to, to take it away. And the final thing I'd say is data still matters in this regard. If you have rising student achievement with traditional public schools, which we've had by and large, and you have more options, maybe it's a, there's a link. Maybe there's a correlation between empowering parents to have as many options as possible and have rising student achievement in the traditional public schools. Florida is the poster child for that. And the argument that somehow public schools do worse when you have rising student achievement is just defies logic. It just doesn't make sense. So, I mean, taking this on the road, uh, you can we can win this argument. And the final thing I'd say is, has there, has there ever been a time in American history where choices are viewed as a, a danger? I mean, go to the supermarket. I, I do the shopping in my family. Um, I use this analogy. I used to use it, but now it's like exploded. Go to, go, go to the milk. There's more milk options than our milk. I mean, it's like, our, like, like, our commissioner of agriculture is trying to do something Counted it up in, in Milan's uh, supermarket that I go to in, in Coral Gables, and there's like 60 different variations of non milk and milk. 60 different variations. And the world is better because informed consumers, empowered to make choices, make choices. Everybody gets better when that happens. The low fat, 40 you know, calorie almond milk that's got some flavor to it creates value. It creates value. And if it doesn't, it goes away. That's how the world works. It's a dynamic world we live in, and our school should be just as dynamic as the rest of it. Thank you. And I, I think you've done a great job of showing it doesn't have to be an us versus them. You're rising. You Buttermilk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we're short on time. We're short on time, Governor. We can't, we can't list all the milk. <laughs> 
do appreciate your passion. Um, and I appreciate uh, real great NC putting this together and having you be able to come speak to uh, policymakers and lawmakers about, uh, you know, yes, there's the place for choice. There's also the work that needs to be done to transform our traditional public schools. And, uh, and that, that's work we can lead here in North Carolina. Absolutely. Can I make a point about real, real great? I can't say that five times in a row. I'd, I'd mess it up probably. But it's, it's really important to have an advocacy group that that not only provides great policy options, and we're, we look forward to continuing to partner with you on that, but also to provide, uh, this is not a political gathering, but um, just for the moment, let's get a little political, for the, for the legislators that are courageous, that have the courage of their convictions, and follow the leadership of their bodies to do big things, someone needs to have their back, because I can guarantee you there are a lot of people that don't that view this as a threat to their economic livelihood rather than a focus you know, on, on students. And so uh, beyond good policy and good intentions, there also needs to be support for the courageous members of the North Carolina Senate and House that are doing the right thing and, and statewide elected officials that are doing the exact same thing. You, you can't, you know, that's how democracy works. You back the people that have the courage to, to do the right thing. And um, I just needed to say that. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure that's appreciated. No one's running for re-election, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, will, uh, I will open up the grill. Great. I think we probably have time for uh, just a few questions from the audience. So, anyone, anyone reference what Jason say it's already beat me to the punch on that. <laughs> Thank you, Governor. Uh, Craig Horn from North Carolina General Assembly. Uh, you spoke about uh, reading coaches and uh, school grades. We're having quite the discussion here in North Carolina about the difference between growth and performance. Proficiency? Proficiency. Yeah. Uh, would so like you to we. comment on, on those two issues as far as one related to the other as and one separate from the other. That's a, uh, that is a nerdy <laughs> education <laughs> policy question I've heard one. And an important one. <laughs> Very important one. <laughs> Being a fellow nerd, I, 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 it, it sent uh, tingles up my spine. <laughs> so, um, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's why I did not use that analogy. <laughs> so, I think it needs to be a mix um, because you want, this is a long term challenge and a long term opportunity. And you want, you ultimately want to get to college and career readiness. You want a, a, a kid graduating from a high school and they can honestly say, I'm either capable of getting a job because I, of my high school experience or they're capable of going to a community college or university of their choice where they don't have to take retake high school math and reading. So that should be, that's the aspiration at the end of the journey. And ultimately that means that everybody needs to get to the proficiencies that make that happen. But in the interim, on that journey, you gotta have continuous improvement. So in our case, we decided basically half of the accountability for schools is related to learning gains, how a, how a student does year to year, and half to the proficiencies, what the expectations were. And that mix, and then we added an extra element of this, which was something that um, um, the feds didn't like uh, under two presidents' uh, administrations, which was we rewarded, we focused on the bottom 25% of every school. <laughs> so part of the challenge of a grading system is if you're in fancy pants high school or middle school, where all the kids, you know, come from intact families and there's lots of PTA volunteers and and uh, and you don't and and so that you can have a high grade there are kids in that school that are in the bottom 25 percent that don't have to get the same attention and so what we decided and I think this was the proper way of doing this we didn't disaggregate based on race or ethnicity we basically said the lower performing kids if you can get learning gains for you know for, for them you're getting added benefit, you're getting added rewards in the school. And what we saw was um, that every kid mattered when you do that in the school, and the grading system really drove uh, student learning across the board. You couldn't discard kids with learning disabilities or kids that were at the bottom 25% of a particular school. 
So I guess we had a little more focus on the learning gain side, but proficiency ultimately is what you want. And, um, and we got it. I mean, we got more kids that were proficient as a result of having a kind of a combined effort. Does that make, is that a nerdy answer to a nerdy question? That's a great answer. The follow-up would be uh, trying to determine, if, what I heard you say is you weighted the, the, the grading uh, so that uh, with regard to the 25%, that lowest 25%, so you gave some extra weight to yeah. growth on the lower 25%. And then for the other 75 percent, you use the 50/50. I'm going to say that's it. Got it. That's it. Thank you very much. Very First guy that never understood what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to take you home with me. <laughs> Thank you, Governor. My name is Emmanuel Wilder. I'm a candidate in North Carolina House District 41. And you're a data guy. I'm a systems analyst, so I appreciate that. So my question to you is when you look across all the data and all the metrics, what metric do you feel like in education we are not paying attention to enough? Well, I think, I mean, <clears throat> what, what this K-12 system in general has ignored is the career readiness issue. Um, and it, there's a huge interest in this now. So this, is, this has been a long time coming, but now it's kind of front and center. And it's a place that's really non-political, non-partisan. There's, there's big interest in the business community, obviously, with the, the not so looming. It's already here, the skills gap that exists. We don't have a labor shortage. We have, a, we have an opportunity gap because people don't have the skills to get a job. And for anybody in business, you realize the, if you can't find skilled workers, I, I use, um, I, I'll, I'll say this because this could have happened anywhere. It happened, actually happened in North Carolina. Siemens built a, um, a plant five or six years ago. I think it was in the Charlotte area. If it was in Raleigh, I, I'm not going to say it was here. Um, but they had, they had, it was for 600 to 800 employees. It was a turbine manufacturing facility. I'm sure it's, up, it's, it's operational. They had 10,000 people apply and uh, only 20% passed the entrance test, or the, the screen test, that required a ninth grade level education. So our challenge is the skills gap now is, is deterring economic progress for all of us. And uh, I think embedding, moving away from kind of a, you know, Votech mentality about education, which is in the back of the high school, or a separate high school, and embedding this learning across the board to make it more relevant and interesting for high school students and give them <laughs> options that otherwise they've not seen is something that I think could be uh, the next iteration of reform. And states are embracing this across the board, and I think it's really exciting. Good. I think with that, um, Governor Bush, thank you so much for taking the time to come here. Thank you, Mark, for your leadership. Thank you.